Well, congregation, now I invite you to uh, open your Bibles, and it is my custom to uh, read a scripture reference, a scripture verse, first from the Old Testament, and then from the New, in introducing a, a text of the scriptures. And so, first of all, get momentary, give me a moment, please. I neglected to note note it down in my notes here. Would you open your Bibles first to the book of Joshua? In the book of Joshua, we have many episodes, as you know. One of the uh, passages in Joshua that stands out is the passage where the people of God are gathered together, and they come before the Lord and commit themselves to the Lord as a covenant people. You'll notice, for example, there are several places where this happens, but you'll notice in chapter 11, verse 16, we read these words. Thus Joshua took all this land, the mountain country and all the south and all the lands of Goshen, the lowland and the Jordan plain, the mountains of Israel and its lowlands from Mount Halak and the ascent to Seir, even as far as Baal, God in the city of Lebanon, Valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. And then verse 21. At that time, Joshua came out and cut off the Anakim from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, from all the mountains of Judah, from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. And then verse 23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all the land that The Lord had said to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and then the land rested from war. I just mentioned that in reference to the gathering of God's people together, making room for them in the promised land, not only, and the people of God from all ages, which is something we're going to see in our New Testament reading. Now, if you would, let's go to our sermon text in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I invite you to keep your Bibles open here in 1 John 2. And for context, we'll begin reading at verse 5. Whoever keeps his word truly... The love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now here are the words of our sermon text. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. 
I've written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. That's our text. We read a little further. Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's God's word for God's people. I ask you to focus on verses 12 through 14 now. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you are very much aware, we have come to the end of an old year, 2017. This morning, we will, by means of this scripture text, be looking backwards, as it were, to the blessings that God has poured out to us once again in another year. This evening, I do invite you back at 6 o'clock, we will look forward and into 2018 and some of the, one of the challenges that lays before all Christians in this coming year. But this morning then, looking back, as it were, on the previous year and counting some of God's blessings upon us as his people. You know the famous Puritan Matthew Henry who lived in the 17th century. I quote him at the beginning of the sermon here. In reference to this particular text, he writes, All Christians are not of the same standing. By the way, you have this quote on the back of your bulletin. All Christians are not of the same standing and stature. There are babes in Christ. There are grown men and old disciples. As these have their peculiar states, so they have the peculiar duties. But there are precepts and a correspondent obedience common to them all, as particularly mutual love and contempt of the world. You'll notice as we read the scriptures here in verses 12 through 14 that it strikes us as the Apostle John writes under the influence of the Holy Spirit that he mentions three groups of individuals or categories of people in the particular congregation he writes to, but such as is common throughout the churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you you have read 1 John recently, or if you can recall the passage, and that's why I read before and after, you'll notice that there are bookended between before this passage and after it very stern warnings and admonitions from the Apostle John. He is facing the beginnings of a heresy in that area of the world called Gnosticism, which we won't get into at this moment, in which some of you are familiar. But he he wants to write very carefully about some of the tests by which true Christians are known. But in the midst of writing these stern admonitions, now he pauses to talk about some of the promises of God as well. He did not want to, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, create doubt in the people of God with all these stern admonitions. Christians, yes, can be discerned from hypocrites by some of these tests that he lays out in scriptures. For example, 15 and following, a love for the world, or previously, walking in darkness, not loving one's brother, and so on. But he writes this way, he assures, he wants to assure us and to assure his first readers some of the benefits that we have in Christ. In fact, on the back of your hymnal, you'll see a quote from a a hymn by Augustus Toplady, who wrote, How vast the benefits divine which we in Christ possess. We are redeemed from guilt and shame and called to holiness. That's just one of the benefits that we have in Christ. Some in Christ's church, as we think about these three categories of believers that the apostle specifies here by the Holy Spirit, some in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Matthew Henry noted, are new Christians, are brand, brand uh, newly converted. Others, after some years, are, we might say, in their spiritual prime. They are in their vigor, they are energetic in their uh, following as disciples of Christ. Others perhaps have been in the service of Christ for decades and have been undergoing sanctification for many years. 
And every congregation, most congregations are made up of these three groups. And so let's listen to the inspired apostle then speak to us, no matter where you fit in, no matter how long you have been in Christ, whether you are a babe in Christ or whether you're one of the ancient ones who've been around a long time and been under the discipleship of Christ for decades. The point is that as we look back to a year in which the blessings of God once again have been poured out upon us, we see that we have, been, we have begun, we are continuing, and we are ending with Christ. I encourage you to follow along in your outline, which should be connected to your bulletin. Beginning, continuing, ending with Christ. We'll see this in three ways. Since there are three groups here laid out for us. First, this is good news for new Christians. Second, this is good news for Christians in their prime. And thirdly, this is good news for senior Christians. We'll take those one at a time. Now you notice as we read that there was repetition here. He speaks to the children, he speaks to the fathers, he speaks to the young men. And he does that twice in repetition. In verse 12 he begins, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. And here, he's not speaking chronologically to little children in the sense of those who are perhaps under 12 years age of age in the congregation, not necessarily. He's speaking to those who are new in Christ. They are new Christians. We sometimes call them babes in Christ, just recently having experienced the new birth. And perhaps some of you fall into that category. There is one, two things that the apostle wants to say to this group, to those who are new Christians. First, your sins are forgiven you through the atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, this is the heart of the gospel, isn't it? When we recite sometimes the Apostles' Creed, one of the things that we confess is that we believe in the forgiveness of sins and the life everlasting. That is at the very heart of the gospel. It is the reason that our Lord Jesus Christ became incarnate, took upon himself a second nature, was born of the Virgin Mary, so that he could uh, atone for our sins. Babes in Christ are sometimes overwhelmed with a sense of forgiveness. Now, babes in Christ are not necessarily children. Sometimes babes in Christ can be my age or even older. Sometimes the Lord is pleased to call a person to himself even on their deathbed, perhaps in their 80s or 90s. And even though they are about to go and meet their Lord, perhaps they are, in a sense, a babe in Christ, having newly discovered and been awakened to the forgiveness of sins. But whether young or old, babes in Christ are... Uh, have this one tenet of the gospel in common, this one precious doctrine, which is most precious to them, the forgiveness of their sins. Whether they have continued many years in their sinful rebellion against God, or whether they are covenant children uh, newly uh, becoming a part of the Christian church, their sins are forgiven. The Holy Spirit here in in this book and throughout the scriptures, is constantly focusing our attention on that point of doctrine, isn't it? On that great, exceeding, and precious promise. It is at the heart of the scriptures throughout, not just here, not just in the New Testament, but from Genesis to Revelation. Already in Genesis 3, we see the promise that though the world is plunged into a state of sinful rebellion against God and under the power and, and dominion of the devil. Yet there is a promise that one will come who will bruise the serpent's head. That one will come, the seed of woman, who will bring about the forgiveness of not only our original sin, but all of our actual sins. And so, throughout this book, as well as all the others, we are reminded over and over again that Christ Jesus is our only source of salvation and that 
that we are motivated as Christians to serve God more as we are reminded of the blessings that come to us from God in Christ. We have here at the very outset the foundation of all the apostles' exhortations and admonitions, namely that Christ suffered hell for every Christian on the cross and before, that the wrath of God that should have been fallen upon you and upon me fell on him, that he was punished as our substitute in our place, that our sins were imputed to him, and that his grace and his good works were imputed to us. His righteousness is imputed to us. And therefore, because of that, we have the forgiveness of sins. The new Christian perhaps is overwhelmed with the sense that Jesus pacified my, and satisfied the wrath of God for my sins, against my sins. The new Christian has just been recently made to realize that in Christ alone there is forgiveness of sins. And notice the language of the scriptures here in 2.12. Your sins are forgiven, and what does it say next? For his name's sake. On account of the name of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because of his name, because of his work, because of his atoning death, because of the shedding of his precious blood as the Son of God and Son of Man, as the only means to provide the forgiveness of sins. The new Christian relishes this basic gospel truth. Not to say that older Christians don't, but this is, this is, uh, the new Christian is, is, this is what he latches onto, the apostle might say. To know that the Father can only appease by looking on me, looking on you, as covered by the blood and the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is true, of course, for all of God's children. New Christians have f been made to flee to Christ, realizing by grace that there is no, not salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And this is the beginning of their new life in Christ, followed by the process, the lifelong process, the decades-long process of growth, sanctification, maturation. That's the first thing that new Christians relish, is the doctrine of the forgiveness of sins in Christ. But there's a second thing here as well. New Christians relish the fact that they have been given the privilege of knowing God. Notice verse 13. I write to you, little children, because... You have known the Father. The Apostle reminds us that we all come into this world as spiritual orphans. We, the, in fact, we are called in other places children of wrath, even as others. That's how we come into this world, every single one of us. We all stand in need of adoption. But this, the, the new Christian has just been made to realize that he has been adopted by God the Father for Christ's sake. We, as we come into this world, are like ignorant children without any knowledge of God the Father until the gospel of grace comes into our hearts and minds, until we are regenerated. How is it that you and I know the Father when billions do not? It is because, according to Romans 8.8, 8, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And this isn't limited just to older new Christians who perhaps come to the faith in Christ in their teenage years or their, or their middle age years or even their later years as new Christians. This also speaks to that covenant of grace which we cherish in the Reformed and Presbyterian faith. Spelled out in Acts 2.38 this way, Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are fall off, far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Yes, even little children, covenant children, often come to know the Father early in life. 
by means of regeneration, by means of God speaking His regenerating, life-giving grace to them and giving them that childlike faith in Christ so that perhaps at even an early age they confess with full confidence and full faith our children's catechism. Who made you? God. What else did God make? God made all things. Why did God make you in all things? For His own glory and such like. A true and genuine faith. They genuinely praise God saying, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. In the book of Joshua in another place, there is a place where the people are gathered around. And what's striking about that particular passage is that there, we read of, of the congregation, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, and then the, 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 song, the writer, the Holy Spirit, causes the writer to make this footnote, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. And so, this is good news for new Christians, whether they are newborns or whether they are newborn into the kingdom of God, even in their old age. That's the first thing. That's beginning with Christ. But there is good news also for Christians who have moved past that stage in their Christian walk and now are in their prime, as we might say. The strong young men, to use the language of the apostle. He writes, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. As we said at the beginning, the language here is not to be taken necessarily chronologically, nor necessarily genetic, uh, uh, gender-wise in terms of this is only written for young men and you young ladies can tune out now until we get to the next point. This is a generic term speaking of those who are in their vigor, in their prime, uh, in the prime of their spiritual life, not physically necessarily, Though it often happens is in many churches that children are born and raised in the covenant community, they, they perhaps can't even hardly remember a time when they didn't love the Lord because the Lord worked His grace in them so young. And so in their teens, in their late teens, perhaps in their 20s, they are in the vigor, the prime of their spiritual life, but not necessarily so. As we said, sometimes the Lord works His grace early, sometimes later. These are for those that have come along now. The, the childishness of their immature Christian faith is behind them. The, the, the days of their old age after decades and decades of following Christ is ahead of them. And they are there in the middle in their spiritual prime, we could say. They have, by God's grace, perhaps you fall, some of you fall in this category you have, as God has been working His sanctifying grace in you over the decades, over perhaps a, a decade or so, you have, by God's grace, been able to put aside some of the immaturity of your early Christian years. You now, by God's grace, are zealous. You're active in the life of the church. These are the folks that the apostle is addressing here when he says, young men. And what he wants to say to this group of individuals in the congregation or in the churches is that you are strong. That you are the ones who are to, in military language, to take the point. Perhaps you've seen, perhaps some of you have some military experience, I don't. Or perhaps you've read a book or seen a movie where someone is charged with taking the point of the squad or of the brigade to take the lead. To be the, on the front lines, we, we say. These are those that are, uh, are spoken of here. Both in the defense of the faith and in the offense of take, um, striking into the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of this world. Taking the gospel forward. Often in this stage of life, God works His grace in causing people to perhaps be motivated to go to the mission field, perhaps to be motivated to go on a mission trip, perhaps to go to a Bible college, or, some, or perhaps to even become an officer in training in the church of Christ, maybe to be involved in a youth group or other, some other form of service before 
the days come when they are too old to do so. These are those that Christ calls to take on the Antichrist, and we'll see more about that. You'll notice if you had continued reading or glanced down the page, you'll notice that that discussion is coming of the, the various Antichrists, plural, who are in the world, even in John's day, and we'll be looking at that this evening in terms of looking ahead into 2018. These are those who Christ gives that spiritual vigor to, to take them on, head on. But there are three characteristics that the apostle notes about this group, what he calls the young men, those in their spiritual prime. They are strength, second, making use of what they've learned from Scripture, and third, victorious in Christian warfare over the evil one. We'll look at those briefly. These are three characteristics of those in their spiritual prime, and perhaps that describes you. First of those characteristics is the characteristics, the characteristic of strength. Notice how he writes. I have written to you, young men, verse 14, because you are strong. Notice the language there. He does not say to them, as we have in many parts of the Scripture, be strong. It's not an imperative, is it? It's an indicative. It's a statement of fact. I write to you because you are strong. That you are in that, that part of your Christian pilgrimage where you are the strongest. When you were a babe in Christ, you were somewhat pretty weak. When you get older in Christ, you're going to have some other characteristics we'll speak of. But this is that time of your Christian walk when you are the strongest, spiritually speaking, in, in, this, in this way, in terms of doing battle with the wicked one, taking the front line. The language here also is in the perfect tense, which doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but, but the idea is that it is something that happened in the past, it had its beginning in the past, but it has continuing results so that you have been made strong in Christ and that is going to continue in a series of victories that the Lord is going to give you. Unspoken here, uh, we will see one source of this strength, namely in a moment, but the, what is not spoken of here is that which every Christian knows, that the source of our strength these are not strong. When he writes to them and tells them they are strong, he's not flattering them. He's not uh, puffing them up and giving them a big head as if their strength is in themselves. This, after all, isn't physical strength. The psalmist says it precisely when he says, The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. In whom shall I be afraid? My mind goes to David, young David, in his early days. Strong, facing down Goliath. Facing the giants. Strong and courageous as a young man. It is a tremendous blessing, brothers and sisters, for fathers and mothers of the congregation to see young men and young women strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. John writes, in fact, in his epistle here, he has no greater joy than to see that his children walk in the truth. We think of, as our mind goes back to the book of Joshua again, we think of those battles not only in Joshua but throughout Israel's history. And we can picture perhaps in our eyes, mind, uh, a mind's eye, the Israel's generals uh, going to battle strong being challenged by the generals, perhaps being challenged by the prophet and encouraged by the prophet about to be strong in Yahweh, that victory was certain. For example, in Psalm 3.6, we read this, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Those are words coming from the mouth of one who is strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Or Psalm 91, 7, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Or here in this very book, 1 John 5, 4, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. That's the first characteristic of this, this group, 
of individuals within the congregation. Those who have strength and given a great deal of spiritual strength in Christ. Then there's a second characteristic. That is that they make use of what they've learned from the scripture. We said that the Lord himself is the source of their strength. But also there's another clue here about the source of their strength. Notice the language of the scriptures here. The word, verse 14, the word of God abides in you. As if to say all of us are weak in ourselves. This, as we think about natural young men, they are, we think of their great physical strength. We watch them perhaps in the the Winter Olympics this time of year. But that is contrasted here with the, that is a natural strength. That is something that can be worked up. But this spiritual strength that's spoken of here is not natural. It's unnatural. It's supernatural. It's above the natural. In other words, this is speaking of those who by the sovereign grace of God in Christ have come to understand the gospel of Christ. They've consented to it by the work of the Holy Spirit in them. And the word of God now abides in them and empowers them. And gives them strength, first through the gospel promises, and then by virtue of exercising themselves in obedience to gospel commands and the growth of the fruit of the Spirit thereby. Just as Psalm 119 reminds us in verse 9, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. This is the source of strength of this group of folks in the congregation. The years that we spend in Christ's word year after year makes us spiritually strong. In fact, we could say the more time we spend in God's word, the stronger we will become. Even as the more time we spend on the, it's that time of year, isn't it? When we see all the commercials about the ellipticals and the Nordic track and and the weight machines and the gym memberships and so on about getting strong this year. Finally, we're going to do it. The more time that we spend in physical exercise, the stronger we will become. But the more time we spend in the spiritual exercise of God's Word abiding in us, the stronger we will become. Christ's Word makes us strong, giving us the grace to use our God-given understanding to resist the evil one and to resist the antichrist around us. Verse 5.5 5 says of this book, says, he who, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Even as in our military, it is not the old and decrepit like people like myself that the army is interested in recruiting. It is the young, it is the strong, those who are trained in their prime, And so it is in the church of Christ. Pastors and elders are always looking for those that they can train to handle the sword of the Spirit in a skillful way. Those who are full of energy, those who are passionate about living for Christ. What makes you strong, Christian? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6.17. That's the second characteristic of this group. And then there's the third. Not only strength, not only making use, spiritual strength, not only making use of what you've learned from Scripture, but thirdly, victorious in Christian warfare over the evil one. And this is repeated for emphasis. Verse 14, I have written to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Notice how it's repeated twice in the passage. As if to say, in Christ, spiritual victories are certain. That doesn't mean we're not of the name and claim it, name it and claim it ilk. We don't bind Satan in the name of Jesus and assume that we have such power in ourselves over him. In fact, even as we move through this process that we're seeing laid out before us, we start as babes in Christ on the milk, unable to have meat. Then the Lord begins to make us strong in Christ. And we are able to take the meat of God's word. Just as when we go to school in kindergarten, we're just first 
we're just first learning our numbers. Then later we're learning to add and subtract and divide. Then later on we comes algebra and geometry. So it is in the Christian life. First, as new Christians, we're relishing the doctrine of forgiveness of sins and life everlasting and knowing God in Christ. Then comes a time of strength because there are battles for us to fight. And Christ equips us in those years to take on the devil. We read in Revelation 15, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. We, are, we have been made and we are being made victorious Christian soldiers by the sovereign grace of God in Christ. As we read in Romans 8, For your sake, yes, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Once again, this perfect tense of past action with continuing result you are overcoming the wicked one time and again. Again, Revelation says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and did not love their lives to the death. This very Lord's Supper that we see here set before us tells us about these very things. We come to the table of the Lord, one of the reasons being that we are weak. We need to feast. We need to be refreshed just as our bodies need physical food and physical drink in order to survive. Jesus Christ is the true meat and drink of our souls unto life eternal. And that's symbolized for us in this meal of which we will partake. So there's good news for new Christians. There's good news for Christians in their prime. And then lastly, there's good news, and briefly, good news for senior Christians. We read, I write to you fathers because you have known him who's from the beginning. And once again, this isn't gender specific, limited only to fathers. This is a generic term in this particular case, referring to those who are parents among the congregation as you were those who are not babes in Christ but yet they're at the same and they're not in their prime anymore physically speaking or even in terms of their the vigor that they had to be involved in all the ways they used to but they are the mothers and fathers spiritual mothers and fathers the spiritual grandmothers and grandfathers of the congregation notice again that this is repeated twice for emphasis these are the spiritually mature members, the most mature members of the church. Notice the language is similar to the comments to the children, the comments here to the fathers. But there is one difference, and that difference is the time reference. You have known him who is from the beginning. With the babes in Christ, the language was you have known the father. Here, though it may be certainly speaking of the very same person, the language is different. You've known him who is from the beginning. That is to say, mature Christians in the congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ are those who have experienced the Father's steadfast faithfulness from perhaps from their very infancy. And now one decade, two, three, four, five, six, even seven decades, maybe longer, they have been under the influence of Christ. They've been his disciple. They have known him from the beginning. They know him who is from the beginning. Even as the fathers uh, has no limits by time and his being extends into eternity past. So there are those among us who seem like they've always been a part of the church of Christ. And we have a privilege sometimes of seeing folks in the church who decade after decade after decade and we're blessed by their wisdom. They have been by shaped and sanded and and molded by the grace of God in Christ, by his sanctifying work of his Holy Spirit over the decades, to have a deep trust in him, which comes with time. Those years of sanctification have produced in them a godly wisdom. They are, as it were, the spiritual parents and grandparents of the congregation, the seasoned saints 
of the congregation. Better equipped than to handle some pointed admonitions like we have here in the book of 1 John. Like grandma and grandpa, spiritually speaking, who sometimes perhaps feel useless because the vigor of their youth has passed and they sense it. They long to engage the way they used to. And yet, brothers and sisters, so far from being useless, they are there pass, to pass on their wisdom acquired by decades of sanctifying grace. And so it behooves and it is incumbent upon us, the rest of the congregation, whether babes in Christ those are, or those who are in their prime, to, they, we do well to seek their counsel and advice and guidance and to follow their example. Now, as you think about that, as we look around the room, even here today, there are those here today who would not have lived as long as you do in the first century. In the first century, in the, when this book was written, life expectancy was only 50, 55 years, perhaps. But today, the sovereign grace of God is at work in, in His people sometimes 80 plus years of learning and living with Christ. Learning and living the gospel of the eternal Son of God. This gospel that we have, brothers and sisters, is a hundred times more ancient than any of us. And we are called to relish that which is ancient. Jesus Christ, after all, is the same yesterday and today and forever. There are some religions in the world who claim to be 4,000, 5,000 years old, but only Christians know him who is from the beginning. And so to the senior saints here among us, pass it on. Pass it on what you've learned, what God has taught you lovingly as fathers and mothers of the congregation. And the rest of us, let us have ears to hear their counsel. Well, as we come to the end then, we see that the Christian life has a beginning we continue through the vigors of the early days of our Christianity. And finally, we come to those sunset years when we are looking forward to being with Christ forever and ever. The gospel of Christ is good news for Christians no matter where you are along that timeline. It's good news for Christ, new Christians, for Christians in their prime, for seasoned, mature Christians. The gospel addresses every age group. It addresses your age group. And the Lord's Supper testifies to us of that grace of God to young and old and all in between. Amen. Each, each group is precious in the eyes of Christ our Savior. And the benefits of the gospel that are symbolized here in the bread and wine come to us at every stage of life. At the beginning, at the middle, and the end. And these are words of grace from Christ our Savior. Well, now we come to the table of the Lord.